So then the question becomes, if the if future history relative to us is soon going to go bad within 15 years, and if I'm reading the meter right in Matthew 25, 11, and following, which is our time, if it goes bad <clears throat> within 15 years and then it's going to keep on being bad until whenever the rapture occurs, we're in an important period of history, number one. Number two, we have a bunch of contradictions that belie that fact. The first contradiction is that when you're doing your thing today, it doesn't seem pretty much at all related to God or His plan or this big massive story that I'm talking about. I mean, there's always r rumors of wars, of course, which is what the passage does cover. But for the most part, people, including you and me, seem to see things as the same old, same old that they've always been, and if anything, we're kind of tired of it. We want change. That's what this whole election's about. Of course, that's what it was about for Obama, too. Everybody wanted hope and change. Yep, we hoped for change, and it changed all right, but not for the better. That was the contradiction then. So the first contradiction now is that here we got God himself, Jesus Christ, talking about an upcoming change. A door gets shut. That's change. It's not for the better. A door gets shut. That was 1998, 1968 in the meter. And that means... That a whole bunch of people who thought they were wise, who were foolish, get shut out. Now, an actual, actual historical play, what's happening down here on the ground, is that we who are actually learning and living on Bible are deemed foolish. And we're getting shut out. So the Lord right there in that text is dealing with the first contradiction. What it seems to be, it's not. What it does not seem to be, it is. That's our first contradiction. I mean, it kind of speaks for all of them. Okay? Here you are learning and living on Bible. You're not busy doing good deeds like everybody else. The election is all about, oh, what government can do for you. Always be scared when you hear people talk like that. For, from time immemorial, there's a second contradiction. From time immemorial, man has claimed that he will help man. But it always comes at a price. And the price is way more expensive than if you didn't get the help in the first place. From time immemorial, people who wanted to, you know, take you over had two ways of doing it. They either just forcibly took you over, and that happened a lot, that's most of our ancient history, or they tricked you. That's how the Jews ended up becoming slaves in Egypt. God raised up Joseph, and through a dream that Pharaoh had, <clears throat> and Pharaoh, you know, Joseph interpreted the dream, that's a running theme in the Bible. Joseph did that. Daniel did that. The idea is that only God would know how to interpret a dream that's occurring solely inside somebody else's head. <clears throat> so now Pharaoh got interested in God. And that was a big deal because he was supposed to be the representative of Ra. Okay? Ra is the name of a God in Egypt. They had a lot of them. And here's this Hebrew, who the Egyptians despised, properly interpreting the dream, and Pharaoh should not, say so should not versus should, Pharaoh should not have listened to this guy over and against all of his other advisors who were allegedly also representing the real gods. But Pharaoh did listen. For all you know, that Pharaoh got saved. 
Um, and Joseph, as a result, ends up being vizier of Egypt. He reclaimed the Fayum Depression that you can find in uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. They don't know that it was Joseph. <clears throat> they do know it was a vizier, and vizier is the title in the Bible for the guy that Joseph became. They didn't call him Joseph. That was his Hebrew name. They gave him an Egyptian name because once you're an official in the country, they give you your own name. That was the way they did it in those days. You know, Nebuchadnezzar changed the name of Dan, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. Okay? They give you names of their own culture to make you more acceptable to that culture. But he was still Joseph. The Pharaoh still believed. And if it wasn't for Joseph, Egypt would have been lost. Now, it didn't look that way to Egypt at the time either. It didn't seem as though. But you'll notice, even the, with that deliverance, real deliverance, in this case, the government really did deliver the people. But it came at a price, even then. Most of the times, government doesn't even really deliver you either, but it comes at a price as if they did. What was the cost and what was the deliverance in the case of Joseph? The cost was pretty obvious. By the time the famine was over, the Egyptians had in, indentured themselves to the government. And Encyclopedia Britannica made a big deal out of that because the first thing was they said, you know, well, this was the way that the Pharaoh used to get rid of the nomarchs. The nomarchs were feudal landlords. And they were sort of vying for power with the Pharaoh. And therefore, everybody came under the government. Okay, but when they came under the government, what they basically had first done is they sold their livestock whatever little they had, they sold their possessions, they sold their labor, and finally they sold themselves. That's the story in the Bible. But just let us be your slaves so we can have enough to eat. And Joseph was a bit, you know, was a, from God. Joseph was literally delivering them. God used him to deliver Egypt, to save Egypt. And he ruled for 80 years, and smack dab in the middle of those 80 years, end of the first 40, beginning of the second 40, <clears throat> Joseph um, ended up, you know, running into his family because they, they didn't have any food either. And that's how they all got re reunited. But the point is, is that what seemed to be the story before Joseph's arrival and that dream was... Okay, government is supposed to protect you. And what's the cost? You pay with your lives. You pay your taxes. You end up working half your life for the government. In an eight-hour day, you're working four hours for the government and four hours for yourself. That's the way it was. And the second way in the ancient world, and modern for that matter, is that if you want government protection, um besides paying the tax otherwise they just take you over and that's what was done in the ancient world and then they crowed about how they were protecting you well you didn't really get protection you need a protection from the government not protection by the government that's the way it is ever since so you'll notice in the second contradiction there is an allegation of somebody particularly a group of somebodies who want power over you, an allegation that these somebodies can save you. The first contradiction was seeming to be one thing but being something else. And this is kind of a furtherance of that, but now it's an application of it. In the first contradiction, you seem to be doing nothing when you're learning and living on Bible using 1 John 1 9 under your right teacher, talking to God about it all day. That doesn't seem to accomplish anything. It's the only thing that accomplishes something for God. And let God take care of the human race. He made them. He can take care of them. That's what God's telling us. Sounds cruel. Sounds cold. 
Yeah, because the real evil is to have some human being replace God and be your savior. That's what government alleges to do. And they don't really save you. They just tax you. Or they take your stuff forcibly. Everything government touches turns to doo-doo. Because good has an extra O in its word. The word is God. But good sticks an extra O in there for good. O for opposition. God, when opposed, becomes good. Remember that. Because you're going to need to. This election is all about that. Oh, we're going to give you free this and free that, says Bernie Sanders. Yeah, and at a cost. And he's, he doesn't lie about that part. Sort of doesn't lie. Oh, well, we're going to have to increase taxes to pay for it all. Yeah, and since when does adding an extra layer of overhead, government regulation, make a product cheaper? Makes it more expensive. So, yeah, you could have had your education at a cheaper price. But he won't say that. He calls it free. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch, honey. You're going to add a layer of bureaucracy, a layer of laws to somebody else in lieu of just leaving it alone. So, yeah, okay, you can get a free education, but when you get out of school, there ain't going to be no jobs. Because they're busy paying the government the money they could have been paying you. That's the way it always works on anything, not just this whole college story. Free health care. Yeah, and the quality of it's going to be what? Free college for state universities only. And you know what the quality of an education is? Not very good. They have this thing on Fox called Waters World. And he goes out to the university campuses. And he asks them basic questions. The kids that are going to these schools, whether it's Harvard, which is supposed to be a good school, or all these other schools that they go to. He asks them basic questions. Like, who's running for president? He shows them pictures of who's running for president. And they don't know. But they're a voting age. They're supposed to know. So how good is college education now when you have to pay $100,000 for it? For the six years, I think, you have to go to school now. In my day, it was four years, and the total bill was 20000 And I got a really good education. But that was in the 1970s. Okay, so there's your, there's your third contradiction. The second is government will save you as a substitute God. That can't turn out well, and of course it doesn't. The third contradiction is, oh, you, you need to get an education. That somehow education, secular education, which is always slanted anti-God, by the way. Somehow secular education is going to make you a better person, get you a job. And, of course, if you were educated, you wouldn't believe in the Bible. But those people who make those allegations, you stop to listen to how they organize their thoughts and how they reason, you realize, honey, education didn't do you very good. Donald Trump claims he went to Wharton. That's supposed to be a really good business school. And probably was a really good business school when he went to it. But he sure didn't learn anything. You listen to a lot of these so-called educated people talk. They, they, their, their brains are completely fried. Just completely fried. Their education just filled them up with a lot of words. And they don't know how to string them together to think out a reasoned thought. Hillary Clinton's very well educated. She went to, what was it, Bryn Mawr or one of those fancy girls' schools. One of them I almost went to. I forget which one it was. She didn't learn anything. Obama. He's highly educated. He didn't learn anything. 
He's made some of the most disastrous mistakes that we've ever had in economics and especially foreign policy. We're going to be paying for what he came up with for years. So the third contradiction is education makes you better. Well, it kind of depends on what kind of education it is. And honey, if you ain't educated in the Bible, and I mean learning and living on Bible using one John 1 John 1.9 kind of educated. If you don't have that kind of education, you can throw any other kind of education you got right out the window. Look at all these Bible scholars, and they have to work hard to get those degrees. How come they can't figure out what day Christ died on? The whole Catholic Church can't even count to three. And nobody goes to school longer than them. The best universities you can attend are Jesuit schools, like Fordham, um, the other one that begins with, a, with an L. It's a common statement that one year in a Jesuit school is worth two or four years somewhere else. And that's because they teach you to argue both sides of a question. But you never learn anything. Because the Catholics to this day cannot count to three. Friday to Sunday is not three days. And of course the Jews are really big on education too. And they're no better. They just had their, their Passover. But Exodus 12 says Passover occurs on the 14th day after the vernal equinox every year. What's to calculate? And Christ died on Passover. Even Jerome in 405, well, 404 and prior, A.D., the guy who came up with the Latin Vulgate for the Catholics, <clears throat> he knew that Christ died on Passover. He did die on Passover. That year, however, they didn't intercalate. So they celebrated Passover four days earlier than it should have been. He died on the day it should have been. That's a big point in the Greek of John 19. Well, how do I know that? But the scholars don't. How do I know what I'm telling you? And they don't know. After 2,000 years of their extensive education... Because I learned and lived on Bible, I used 1 John 1 9 under my right teacher, and I kept asking God, how do I find proof of all this stuff? Because there are pastors who know what I just told you. There aren't very many. So there seems to be, first contradiction, there seems to be no valid use of what you're doing when you're just simply learning and living on Bible all day. There seems to be a government savior that's constantly telling itself it's your savior, but it never saves you anything. It just taxes you. And there seems to be a superiority in those who teach. A superiority in those who went to school. A superiority in those who went to college. but they can't count to three. Being to get an, a sense of how all these contradictions kind of line up, of course, the fourth one, this is, this, this is what the first three kind of lead to. The fourth one, if you do good deeds for people, you're better and you're a good Christian. Really? Do you know how many good deeds have been done since the founding of the world? Government has done a lot of good deeds. Education, the people who get educated, they are real hung up on doing good deeds. But kind of like government, the good deed that they do ends up costing the people who got the benefit of the good deed more than if the good deed wasn't done in the first place. I mean, all of these educated people, all of this government work from the founding of the world, and the poor are poorer than ever. Poorer in education, poorer in income, poorer in skills, poorer in thinking. 
if you were to go into, well, maybe not Harlem, it's upscale now. But if you were to go into, I don't know, some depressed area in the Appalachians, hire a couple of thousand of those poor people, black, white, and other colors, but mostly white, and try to get them to build a pyramid, because that was built using uneducated labor. You couldn't do it. You couldn't even hire educated people to build that pyramid. We still don't know how they did it in the ancient world. We're speculating on how did they build those pyramids. We don't know. And of course, the ones who built the pyramids were the Jews. God, you know, told Jacob to go into Egypt. Joseph saved Egypt. And they got so prosperous that the Egyptians got jealous. And so one of their, the later pharaohs said, mm, we got to do something about all these Hebrews in Goshen. Goshen was in Lower Egypt, which is really Upper Egypt. In other words, it's higher on the map. It was really good land for sheep, and the Egyptians hated shepherders. But the Jews were shepherders. So they were there. And so, a kind of exercise of eminent domain, Pharaoh said, well, you know, we really need grain. We need to store grain. So we need to be build pyramids for our grain. There are two kinds of pyramids. One is a monument, you know, to a dead Pharaoh to hold his bones in some deep recess way down, 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 down below where nobody will find it. And the other purpose of a pyramid was to store grain. And so gradually they tricked the Jews into becoming temple slaves by use of eminent domain, taking over their stuff in the name of the Commonweal of Egypt. Good deed. Good deed for all of Egypt. And it was kind of ironic, of course, because it was Joseph who saved Egypt because of the way he had the grain redone. So it was kind of a trick. And gradually the Jews became temple slaves. But being a temple slave was a good job. If you're going to have to be a slave, that's the kind of job you'd want. And you got the most food, you got the best care. You know, your rulers were nice to you for the most part. But they got jealous too, so they'd beat you up. Okay, well, good deeds are like that. This fourth contradiction about good deeds. That's what they, that's what good deeds do. They beat you up. I don't know if you've ever noticed. But people who are busy on good deeds. They're constantly beat up with them. And they're constantly beating other people up with them. After all the good I did for you. So where'd the education go? So where's the benefit of this government? that keeps on harping on you afterwards it'll never let you forget what it did for you after all I've done for you you get to the point where you just don't even want anybody to do a good deed for you anymore hmm? because if the cost of a good deed done for you is that they harp on you forever after you owe me, you owe me, you owe me always implicit then you just kind of want to not have anybody doing you any favors, okay? So here's the fifth contradiction. God doesn't want anything of you. I mean, even the unbelievers understand that. Even the atheists are busy saying, why doesn't God do something? They're trying to make God do good deeds. But if he did good deeds, wouldn't he have to lord it over you? But he doesn't. He tells you what right and wrong is. He tells you what he'll bless and what he'll punish. And then you're free to do whichever you want. He's not going to hold your feet to the fire. 
He's not going to demand you do what he says. He's a God. He's just. It's That's his nature. He's got to govern. If somebody does something wrong, he's got to look at the whole picture. And does that person get away with it or not? And nobody really gets away with anything, but on, at our end, it seems like they do. Just remember, eternity's a really long time. Everybody who's screwing up now and keeps on screwing up and seems to get away with it, one day they're going to die. And even if they're saved, and most especially if they're saved, they're going to have to live with knowing that they wasted their whole life on good deeds or on bad deeds or on any deeds other than God deeds, which is learning and living on Bible under your right teacher, using one John 1 John 1.9 is needed, and talking to God about it is needed. They didn't do that. And they got to live all of eternity knowing they didn't do that. Because once we're dead, honey, this fifth contradiction of God, once we're dead, we're going to realize how learning and living on Bible, using one John 1 9, under my right teacher, and talking to God about it, that was the best use of time, the happiest way to live of all the alternatives that the world and Satan would throw at you. So if that's the highest and best, because it is, because it's the only thing that does anything for God, you're learning how to think thoughts that please God. That's all. You're learning how to think thoughts that please God. And it begins to you begin to understand how enjoyable those thoughts are. And you begin to enjoy them yourself, and so you begin to have a really good life, even if you're hurting. Because the cross, Christ was hurting, and yet he enjoyed it. That's what scripture says. Hebrews 12, 2, Isaiah 53, 11. Yireh, he will see. Yizba, he will be satisfied like eating a good meal. Sabea is the Hebrew verb there in Isaiah 53, 11. Yiz ba, he will be. The yiz is future tense. Yiz ba, for, from Sabea. He will be satisfied like eating a good meal. That means pleasure. Learning and living on Bible under your right teacher, and talking to God about it, ends up, it isn't at first because you don't know how to do it and you don't understand. But if you keep at it, it ends up being a pleasure that nothing in this world can touch. And you can be hurting. And you're still happy. Now my pastor kept on saying that for years. And I believed him because it just makes sense. If God's doing it, it's got to be happiness because otherwise God's a masochist and that's not possible. But now I'm going through it on a daily basis. I feel like crap all the time now. And I'm happy. I've never been happier in my life. And it's like, well, why? Because I know him. Because I understand. It's really weird. The two juxtaposed. Well, there's your, there's your fifth contradiction. God himself. He's a contradiction. Why would God, if he's holy, allow all this crap to happen? Isn't that what the atheist is always saying? Why if God, if he's the right God... Or he's real, or he's holy. Why doesn't he do good deeds? That's a fair question. But you first have to ask the other fair question. How good are the good deeds that you're think, thinking God should be doing? Because, honey, all the good deeds you want to look at in history or current, they got big costs underneath them. And you have to ask yourself, like for example, in the Civil War, wouldn't we have better off been better off if we didn't have a Civil War in the first place? That ended up enslaving the blacks worse. Because it prolonged the causes of, of black slavery in the first place. In the United States. In the United States, they got real huffy in the North. 
Well, you're black, you're a former slave, therefore you're inferior. Well, that didn't do the blacks any good then. And of course, I maintain that the United States was preserved solely because of the blacks, because they really started believing in God. You know, salt of the earth. They were the salt of the earth, the rest of us whites. Well, you can't say much good for us, except that we... In the South, anyway, they decided, you know what, the blacks, blacks ought, ought, to, ought to be able to have, you know, Bible too. Thank God. And they took to him in a big way. Now, see, there's a com, there's a contradiction, and there's the example. They were slaves, but they believed. And God delivered, just like out of Egypt. So, God's way of handling a thing, he's just a big walking contradiction all by himself. God's way of handling a thing is to let a thing have its natural consequences. And of course, the Civil War did have quite a few consequences. And he used it to free the blacks. But the people used it to continue their, what do you want to call it? It's not exactly prejudice. It's a need to look down on somebody else in order to think well of yourself. It wasn't really because they were black. It was because they were slaves. That's the way the, the Egyptians came to look down on the Hebrews. They wanted to look down on them, is the point. They wanted to look down on anybody. Well, that's what good deeds are. Now, if I did a good deed, then I'm better than you. Really? So what you should God have for good deeds? Why should God want to do a good deed? Because God isn't about him being better than you. He made you at birth, created your soul himself directly that's why you're not evolved imputed that soul to the fetus that emerged from what would then become your mother he did that I called you I formed you I made you those are all refrains in the Bible to you know remind you of Genesis 2 7 hey God directly makes the soul at birth nobody else well he did that but he's not lording it over you He's not trying to say, well, see, I'm superior to you. Ah. If, 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 if superiority was an issue to him, you'd not exist in the first place. Okay, so good deeds is all about self-promotion. I did a good deed for you. And then you better pay me for it for the rest of your life. So God isn't into doing good deeds because that's not what he made you for. He made you for intimacy. So there's your contradiction in God. I'm superior, yeah, okay. But what I want is you. And you don't have to be superior. You don't have to be good. You don't have to be inferior. You don't have to be anything. Just be you. And oh, by the way, you're going to, once you look at me, you're going to want something to do that makes you feel good. And, and give back to me so here's what you can do I'll put my word in you and that will be a pleasure to you and it's a pleasure to me because I like hearing the thinking that goes along with my own and oh by the way if you do that I'll bless the world for all the good deeds it says it wants in a manner that's going to hopefully teach it that what it wants isn't good for it not only I'm good for it because I made the world just like I made you. But you don't have to worry about all that. You just learn and live on Bible under your right teacher. And talk to me about it from time to time. And then I'll do all the good. So these contradictions are kind of important, huh? Not at all what they seem to be.